Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by, for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place Path Train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger and IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102, lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org. This week on NJ Business Beat, a show of strength in the job market, but that means a major change for a pandemic era assistance program. Plus, tax day is just a few weeks away, and we're highlighting what's new for your taxes this year, as well as giving you some last-minute tax filing tips. And we're putting the war in Ukraine in focus, digging deep into how Russia's invasion is impacting the global economy and what that means for your daily finances. That's ahead on MJ Business Beat. This is NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. Hello, I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Thanks for joining us on NJ Business Beat. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel to get alerted when we post new episodes and clips. If you want a new job but aren't looking for one, you're missing out. Jobs are plentiful, at least according to new data released this week. Each month, New Jersey-based payrolls processing company ADP puts out its monthly tally of new jobs. It says in March, companies added 455,000 new positions, which was a bit more than forecast. The hospitality sector showed strong growth, no doubt a continued rebound from pandemic-related job losses. With the job market continuing to improve, the state labor department has announced that extended unemployment benefits will come to an end on April 9th. Some 20,000 unemployed workers in New Jersey are currently receiving those benefits, which were paid out during the pandemic when the state's unemployment rate was high. But now the jobless rate has fallen under the 6.5% threshold for continuation of the program. Officials say New Jersey has regained 90% of the jobs lost when COVID-19 slammed the economy in March and April of 2020. Hearings on Governor Murphy's proposed state budget continued this past week, giving members of the public an opportunity to have their say on where the money should go. Members of the Senate Budget Committee heard that more money should be allocated to New Jersey's Main Street Recovery Fund, which helps small businesses. They also heard from advocates who said additional funds should be dedicated to providing rental and utility assistance. And as we hear from NJ Spotlight's John Reitmeyer, environmentalists testified that New Jersey needs to stop diverting money out of a clean energy fund. One of the big asks is that $82 million not be rated from the clean energy fund, which is supposed to promote energy efficiency and the use of cleaner burning fuels or even solar and wind. And so the state has historically taken money from that fund and used it to help cover NJ Transit's operating budget. Environmentalists are very upset to see, again, in an era of climate change affecting New Jersey, that again, New Jersey would be raiding some of this money to help um, you know, keep the lights on at NJ Transit. Another idea on how the state should spend its revenue comes from two Republican lawmakers who say families should get a $500 tax credit to help them deal with the high cost of gas and other things. Republican Senator Ed Durr and GOP Assemblyman Hal Wirtz are sponsoring a bill that would provide a $500 refundable income tax credit to families when they file their 2021 state tax returns if their income is less than $250,000. This idea has been kicking around for a bit, but this week, Republicans in the Senate and Assembly called on the legislature's Democratic leadership 
to convene a session to adopt the legislation. The call to action came after Governor Murphy recently said that he was open to any creative ideas on inflation. The governor is moving his clean energy agenda forward, but critics say the cost of solar and wind initiatives is not known. The state appears to be ready to release a comprehensive cost analysis by fall. Ahead of that, there are concerns that the transition to clean energy will lead to higher utility bills for residents and commercial customers. During testimony at a recent hearing of the Board of Public Utilities, Eric Jezero of the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey discussed the cost of the planned shift from using natural gas to electricity in commercial buildings. Look, there's a cost, all those other things that we talked about a moment ago, solar, wind, um, etc. Those costs will be born in the rate. So we will be paying those as rate payers and as consumers and citizens. But the cost to electrify is outside of that, and that will be coming directly out of our pocket as opposed to out of our pocket through our rates. And the, the costs are astronomical, and it's time for the legislature to engage the administration on this. This past week, Amazon workers in Staten Island and Alabama voted on whether or not to unionize. While the rate of union membership has declined sharply in the last few decades, a Gallup poll last fall found that 68 percent of Americans approve of labor unions. That was the highest reading since 1965. In New Jersey, the Hotel and Gaming Trades Council recently opened its first office in the state. This, as workers at 10 New Jersey hotels voted to ratify contracts with the union, which already represents thousands of workers in our state. Union President Rich Morocco expects his membership will continue to grow, and he sees a resurgence in organized labor due to the pandemic. We have seen the pace of, of workers joining our union increase more recently, um, in part as a result of the pandemic. You know, workers now uh, know that they deserve better wages, better benefits, safer working places, and that the best way to accomplish that is by joining a union. On Friday, Jersey City hosted a parade in honor of the St. Peter's Peacock's historic run in the NCAA basketball tournament. And the school has plenty to celebrate. The Peacock's win streak has attracted a lot of attention, including from donors who were inspired to open their wallets and give. According to Bloomberg, donors pledged or gave close to $2.3 million to the school while the Peacocks were strutting their stuff in the tourney. That is a 278 percent increase over last year's pledges. Well, you are running out of weekends to get your taxes in order as the filing deadline is fast approaching. The IRS extended the tax filing deadline this year to Monday, April 18th, due to a holiday on April 15th. I talked with Nicole DeRosa, a senior tax manager with Wisson Company, to get you some tax filing tips. Nicole, among the tips that you are passing on to New Jersey residents when it comes to taxes, there is a tip that you have in terms of how to deal with this IRS backlog that we've heard about. So how do you get your returns fastest? Fastest way to get your return filed would be electronically, uh, filed and processed. Now, avoid everything. Um, possible with regard to snail mail, if you can at all costs, do not send your return in via paper. Uh, otherwise, you probably won't see that refund for a very, very long time. So electronically file your tax returns and also provide banking information so that refund can be directly deposited into your account. So a few things people should pay attention to this year. Um, the child care tax credit has been a, a big issue in terms of some people not knowing how that might impact them beneficially. What should you do with that? So the advanced child tax credit, it was essentially an advanced tax credit monthly credit throughout the year last year that needs to be reconciled on your tax return this filing season. So if you did receive advanced credits, you need to make sure that you are properly reconciling those amounts on your tax return. The IRS knows what they gave you. If you if you submit a return and it doesn't match, the IRS is going to kick it into a second manual review, which would then subsequently delay your refunds. 
And also, I know uh, it's time for a heads up for anyone who was buying and selling cryptocurrencies. What should you be aware of there? If you did sell or trade um, or exchange uh, virtual currency, make sure that you are properly reporting these transactions on your tax returns. Don't just ignore them. And Nicole, what's the latest on charitable contributions and what can be deducted? So if you do not itemize your deductions and you do donate to charity, if you're married filing joint, you're able to claim a $600 charitable deduction, $300 for all other filing statuses. Now, keep in mind, GoFundMes do not count. And Nicole, there's some specific deductions when it comes to your state tax return. Let's go over those. Yes. So here in New Jersey, uh, they are a little bit more gracious with the medical threshold. So the IRS, the federal threshold is 10% if you itemize your deductions. Here in New Jersey, though, the threshold is only 2%. So even if you don't reap a benefit on the uh, federal return for itemizing your deductions for medical, still make sure you're factoring into the equation your medical expenses. You might reap a benefit just because of the lower threshold. Also, New Jersey does allow you a rent deduction. They say that if you rented property or if that was your primary residence, you paid rent, they allow up to 18% of your rent paid as a property tax deduction on your New Jersey return. Nicole, great. Thank you for those last minute tips. They are much appreciated. You're welcome. We want to turn our attention now to the war in Ukraine and its global economic impact. We're putting the economic cost in focus this week. We first experienced rising gas prices due to fears of oil supply disruptions in the region. In the past month, U.S. oil prices climbed from about $95 a barrel to $108 a barrel by midweek. But then on Thursday, President Biden announced a plan to release 180 million barrels of oil from the nation's strategic petroleum reserves in an effort to reduce gas prices. Our family budgets, your family budgets, to fill a tank, none of it should hinge on whether a dictator declares war. So today I'm laying out a two-part plan, not only to ease the pain that families are feeling right now, but to end this era of dependence and uncertainty and to lay a new foundation for true and lasting American energy independence. The war is pushing up prices on other products, including one you might not think too much about, and that's fertilizer. Fertilizer prices have skyrocketed about 40 percent since Russia's invasion. Russia was a top exporter of fertilizer before sanctions were put in place. This is weighing heavily on the nation's farmers and leading to even more food inflation. Take a look. Over the past month, the price of cheese is up more than 13 percent. Milk is up 11 percent. Wheat is up six and a half percent. It's worth noting that Russia and Ukraine are big wheat exporters, although not to the U.S. For more on the impact of the war on the world's food supply, I spoke with Morgan Williams, who is president and CEO of the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. The Washington, D.C.-based council represents the interests of the hundreds of U.S. businesses active in Ukraine when Russia invaded. This has obviously been a very trying few weeks, and I'm sure everything has changed at your organization. Tell me what has been happening since Russia invaded Ukraine and how businesses are, are trying to help. When Putin invaded Ukraine, it made a major significant difference because businesses like stability. Businesses like for their employees to be safe. They like for their data and their assets to be safe. So many of them had already put in emergency plans. Some of them had already moved their people out of Ukraine uh, or they'd moved them to Western Ukraine and they'd moved particularly their virtual assets out of Ukraine. So it disrupted everything and uh, it continues uh, every day to be more disruptive to the business community and to the productivity of Ukraine. Have you seen the business community step up efforts on the humanitarian side of things? Yes, we have. The U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, the minute Putin invaded, uh, we started working with our companies. We started telling them which uh, private voluntary organizations, humanitarians, we thought could, were on the ground and could make good donations. And as uh, far as we know right now, the members of the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council have contributed over $100 million 
to a wide variety of international charities and also ones from the United States. What are you hearing from some of the companies as they try to manage through this situation? Are they fearful of their employees? Are they fearful of their assets? Are they, um, quite frankly, surprised at how quickly the situation decelerated? Uh, the companies, uh, yes, of course, are very upset because uh, many of them have been in Ukraine for uh, 20, 25 years. They looked at Ukraine as a long-term market. They looked at Ukraine as a food basket for the world uh, to be a major exporter of food around the world. Ukraine has increased their agriculture production and could do a lot more. They're the top exporter of sunflower seeds, sunflower oil, grape seeds, corn, uh, soybeans, and uh, it's gonna have an effect on the world's food supply. You've raised a lot of very uh, important issues here. What is your hope for the next couple of weeks in terms of what happens in Ukraine? So the United States has got to do a lot more to stop Putin, and they could. Uh, and they got to do a lot more to help the farmers of Ukraine. We heard the United States government was running around the world looking for places they could buy food to ship it to poor people. What they need to be doing is helping the farmers of Ukraine get out their spring crops and continue their operations. I appreciate your passion on this very difficult subject. I wish you the best of luck and I do hope things improve. Thank you for speaking with me. Well, thank you very much. It's a worldwide uh, problem. It's gonna affect the whole world. And the whole world needs to come to the defense of Ukraine who's at the forefront now in the battle against Mr. Putin. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In New Jersey, some residents are showing their support of Ukraine by boycotting Russian products. But some say that's hurting local businesses and jobs. For instance, business is down at this Luke Oil gas station in Newark. While Luke Oil Company is based in Russia, the gas station franchises are locally owned. We all want to do our part to support Ukraine. We all want to do our part. We want to vocalize our voice by saying, hey, I'm against what Russia is doing. And so do I. You're killing the small business owner in New Jersey. You're giving a mosquito bite to Mother Luke Oil in Russia. The people who are getting caught up in all of this are the employees. And they could be a potential loss of maybe 600 to 1,200 jobs on account of this kind of a boycott. New Brunswick-based Johnson & Johnson is the latest company to stop selling some products in Russia. J&J &J says it will no longer sell personal care products, joining other big American companies in ceasing some operations there. However, J&J &J will continue to supply medicine to Russia. Earlier this month, J&J &J said it would suspend clinical trials or any additional investment in Russia. Meantime, J&J &J is increasing humanitarian aid for Ukraine, and it is not the only New Jersey company to do so. Hackensack Meridian Health has donated $100,000 in critical supplies to Ukraine. I talked with the health system CEO, Bob Garrett, who says they're ready to do more, including sending medical personnel. Your hospital system gave a donation to help the people of Ukraine, specifically medical supplies, what sort of products and um, uh, supplies will some of the Ukrainians receive from the donation? So uh, what we did is we donated 21 full pallets, which is the equivalent of a full tractor trailer truck. It, it consisted of baby food. It consisted of masks, uh, disinfecting wipes. Um, it has a value of over $100,000. And we chose those products because we understood that's what's needed most critically in the Ukraine uh, today. Um, in addition to, to what Hackensack Meridian um, has given, uh, our physicians and our team members have really stepped up in a, uh, in a big way. There's, uh, they are making their own donations uh, through our sources and through their own sources. We've encouraged them to do so. So I'm really proud of the uh, Hackensack Meridian team for, uh, for really stepping up and making these contributions at a very critical time in terms of Ukraine's history. 
From what you know, how dire is the situation in terms of the need for medical care? And is there enough personnel to help people who are injured, people who have fled the borders and are trying to seek safety? The, um, the situation is extremely critical right now. We have uh, millions of people on the move, uh, refugees that, um, you know, that need food, need supplies, uh, need medical care, uh, need such things like baby food, as I mentioned before. And they do need masks, too, as, uh, as COVID has uh, spread through uh, Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe. So it is a it is a very criti critical time, you know. I think um, certainly uh, President Zelensky of of the Ukraine has made a plea for um, you know additional personnel as well, you know um, assistance where wherever possible. And I know the U.S. government is is working through some of those uh, issues, as is the European Uni Union and our NATO allies. But um, I think there's a need for supplies, there's a need for equipment, and for personnel. So we're doing what we can, and certainly we, you know, we we've had people who have uh, volunteered to go over there as well. We're you know, we're just waiting for, uh, you know, the green light from the government. And in terms of making sure the supplies got to where they have to go, you're working with people on the ground, organizations that ensure what leaves New Jersey gets to those people in need, right? That's right. So we're working with a organization called the Afia Foundation, A F I A. And uh, what they do is they collect unused medical supplies and equipment through the New York, New Jersey metropolitan area. And then they share them globally with countries, um, communities, even states within the U.S. that are, are in need of these supplies and equipment. And they, they've been a great partner. Uh, we have good experience uh, with them through uh, their work with the Greater New York Hospital Association, whom we're a member of, and also through the American Hospital Association, who we participate with. So we feel by working with the Afia Foundation that, that the supplies and equipment will get to the Ukraine in an efficient manner, manner, a timely manner, and will get to the people that are most in need. Bob, really great to hear some of the efforts that your health system is doing for Ukraine. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me, Rhonda. Another Jersey company that has stepped up to help the people of Ukraine is Quest Diagnostics. It announced a $500,000 donation to Project HOPE to support humanitarian crisis relief efforts in Ukraine and for Ukrainian refugees in Eastern Europe. I spoke with Quest Chairman, CEO, and President Steve Ruskowski. Quest Diagnostics did make a donation to support the people of Ukraine. Why did the company feel this was the right thing to do at this time? We believe in watching what's going on with the horrible situation in Ukraine, that it's the right thing for us to do to make a donation to an organization we think that would would be able to deliver the needed help around medicine and medical supplies to the country itself, but also to the refugees that are going to other countries around Eastern Europe. And why did you select Project Hope? You alluded to it a little bit there, but what kind of work were they doing that made you feel that this was the right fit for you? Yeah, I've known Project Hope for many years. I actually served on the board uh, for about 20 years. You know, Project Hope goes back to 1958 uh, with uh, actually getting a, a ship from the U.S. Navy to deliver medicine and health to the developing countries. And it's grown from there as an organization that builds sustainable support for countries around the world. So I knew of their capabilities and other corporations like us have worked with Project Hope to distribute goods in kind and equipment. And actually over my years of experience, uh, they've been instrumental in building a, a number of children's hospitals throughout the world. One of which was in Basra, Iraq, around the Iraq war. And actually were instrumental in helping the Polish children's hospital in Krakow. So I thought given my experience and what they've done before, this would be a good place given their presence in Eastern Europe to do what we wanted to do for the for Ukraine and also the surrounding countries. It seems like the humanitarian crisis unfolds daily and certainly is not improving. What are some of the concerns on the medical front that you have? And I know I personally have read a lot about fears of COVID spreading because the vaccination rate was so low in Ukraine. And now you have some refugees as well uh, moving across the border. 
as time goes on, we're going to see just general health issues raising up in some of those refugee camps. And yes, you know, COVID's already been with us and is still with us. And so, you know, there's always the risk of you know, more spread of the virus that's already in Poland and the surrounding countries, uh, particularly as we go through these latest phases of what's happening with COVID around the world. So that's just an additional set of issues that are going to be managed going forward. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate the conversation. Okay, thank you very much, Wanda. Have a good day. And that wraps up our show for this week. Thank you for watching NJ Business Beat. And join us next week when we look at how the state's tourism industry is gearing up for the summer season. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. Enjoy your weekend. Funding for NJ Business Beat provided by, for more than 110 years, NJBIA has been focused on the advancement and success of our members. We're the voice representing all industries, working together to help build a more prosperous New Jersey through advocacy, support, networking, and benefits. NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place PATH train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger and IBEW Local 102, proudly serving New Jersey's business community since 1900. Local 102. Lighting the path, leading the way. Visit IBEW102.org.